Thank you, Ashish. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is for us to be here with so many dear friends. And listening to the choir, you can tell how you've, and thank you, Preeti, for the work you've been doing with the choir. You can tell how everyone has gotten more and more in tune, more and more reflecting of and expressing God's presence. <clears throat> Since when Ashish introduced us, he talked about our many years on the spiritual path. I just have to share a personal story that took place early on that came to mind as I heard you all singing, O oh Master. And we want to especially thank Megha for the beautiful solo, beautifully done. But most people don't know the origin of this song and they attribute it to Swamiji. And in fact, Swami did add to it. But <clears throat> in the very early years of Ananda, there was a very wonderful woman who was a dear friend of mine. She was very beautiful, very talented. She was a gifted pianist and a singer. And we were very close friends. Her name was Mukti. And one time, this was about 1974, Mukti went camping alone. And she came back and she said, I've been given the most beautiful song, and it was O oh Master. And she sang it, and it was so beautiful. But then, <clears throat> about two years later, Mukti was stricken with a very terrible illness from which she never recovered. And so, and then Swami took the song, and he refined it a bit, added, changed the words a bit. But for me, this is always Mukti's song. So when you sing it, I hope you remember a very beautiful young woman who was inspired to write this song. Forgive my tears. I didn't mean to do this, but I, I just felt to share that. So we have such an important topic today to talk about meeting life's challenges with courage and joy. But I think it's important to take a step back first before we speak of life's challenges to ask ourselves the question, what is life? What, for each one of us, what is the purpose of this life? Is it just to be born get an education, acquire material goods, have a family, and then be no more. I think we, none of us would be here if we felt this was the end of the story. We come back lifetime after lifetime, and we enter a new body, perhaps a new country, a new culture. Master even said a, perhaps even a different planet. And the reason we keep coming back is to learn how to untie the karmic knots that we ourselves have tied that hold us in bondage. And so every one of life's experiences, if it's beautiful, if it's terrible, if it's indifferent, Everything that comes to us is something that we have put into play in the past through misunderstanding of life's laws, of divine laws. And we have, through our past actions, we have become out of, lost our attunement with our oneness with God, with the understanding of what makes for a truly meaningful life. And so we come into any particular incarnation and we have lessons to learn. It's really as simple as that. And if we can approach our life in this way, 
it's not necessarily to that we have a happy, fulfilling, healthy, successful life. If those come, then that karma has brought, we have brought that karma to us. But if they don't come, if it's all the opposite, if it's poor health, failure, whatever it might be, then <clears throat> we need to address those problems and not say, oh, this is terrible, poor me, why did this have to happen? None of those things, but just true courage comes when we understand the game of life. And it's simply to work our way out of the karmic maze that we have created in which we are, I won't say trapped, because with God's grace we are not trapped, but we are lost. We are lost in the maze of past karma. And so every challenge, every test, is really an opportunity to learn a lesson. And if we see the test in this way, you don't have to say, well, how do I get courage? How do I have joy? It's just, it, say you're, uh, you've taken a course in mathematics and the teacher gives you an assignment and it's difficult. And you say, oh, why me? I, I must have done something terrible to get this assignment or it's we're learning the teacher is trying to teach us what we need to know and when we pass that exam are we done no we're not done we get the next one until we become more and more flowing in god's wisdom and then when a test comes you don't even really notice it so much because you understand the mechanism of how to deal with it. And you just say, of course, that's why I came into this life. And particularly if you have repeated patterns that the tests keep coming and keep coming, be aware, look in your own life and say, why is it always that? Well, it's always that because you haven't quite learned the lesson. I will pause and uh, tell a little joke here. You know, in Italy, when uh, there is an opera perf performance or something, uh, if the singer sings a wonderful song, the audience will applaud and stand up and sometimes say, encore, encore, again, again. And um, so there was this operatic soprano, and she'd sung this song, and uh, the people stood up, encore, encore. So she sang it again. This went on several times. And finally, there was one little old man, and he kept saying, encore, encore. And she said, sir, I can't sing anymore. My voice is tired. And he said, you'll sing it again until you get it right. <laughs> and so <laughs> for all of us, that's what it's about. You'll be tested again and again until you get it right. And rather than being defeated by it, just get the, the game. Oh, I understand now. And so what are the steps we can take if a challenge comes to us? First of all, whatever it might be, step back. Don't let your emotions react and, oh my, this is terrible. How will I overcome this? step back and say, what is the lesson I am supposed to learn? That's step one. And if you don't understand it at first, meditate on it. Ask people who you trust their opinion. But tr once you understand what the lesson is, you are halfway to solving the problem. Really, that's true. So under what is the lesson I'm supposed to learn from this challenge? Step two, and this is the, the hard part, how much energy do I need to put out to learn this lesson? Because if you just do it in your mind and say, okay, you know, I'm always jealous. I, I, you know, I'm always in a situation where I find myself being jealous. But if you don't put out the energy to change that attitude, it will keep coming back. So it's not just mental understanding. It's putting out the necessary energy, the determination, 
to see that through till the end. And then a part of that as well is to, when we understand how much energy do I have to put out to finish this challenge, to overcome, to learn the lesson, then we also say, God, how much energy will you put in to help me with this process? So we can't do it alone. But if we get clear and say, I will give it everything I've got, but I can't cross the finish line, I will always fall short without your support, your strength, your energy guiding me forward. So the first step is to say, what is the lesson of this challenge? Second, how much energy do I need and to call on God to make up the deficiency? And then third, what attitude will help me get through this and let me use my energy and my understanding when I start to deviate from that test, come back, I will remain in that attitude. And you will find, if you practice this, things that seemed elusive to you, tests that seemed overwhelming to you, will start, you will start to gain control over them. And one final thing I will say, and then Jyotishji will also share. You know, I was sharing just this morning as we were driving over with some friends, another story that happened. This was with Swami Kriyananda. But today in modern India, we find ourselves in an environment that is extremely distracting and outward. And it's, our energy is pulled outside of ourselves all the time. Cell phones and everything, job demands, working hours, everything. But <laughs> I, I won't, well, I, <laughs> I saw a picture of a new, some fashions and they're designing boots with a clip for your cell phone so you can look and see <laughs> what's going on. I, I don't think I'll get those. But, but always remember in the collective wisdom of this great culture, there is such depth and such ability to transcend outwardness, materialism. The story I recalled this morning was when Swami Kriyananda first came to India in 2003. Many of you met him in those early years. And at that time, he settled in Gorgon, and we rented a, a big house, big ashram house, because there were many of us. And Jyotish and I had come over, and we were staying in a little room. But one of Swamiji's old friends, a man from Calcutta, Devi Mukherjee, he wrote the beautiful book, Shaped by Saints, if you recall, if you've read it. He, he was an old friend of Swami's, a guru by, a very, very saintly man. We were blessed to know him. And he came from Calcutta to greet Swami and was staying in the ashram. And one morning, Swami, early, Swami called us up to his room, and he said, can you go get Devi, knock on Devi's door, and invite him up to take tea with me? So I ran down the steps, and I knocked on Devi's door, and there was a pause. And then finally, a very quiet voice said, yes, and I opened the door. And I'll never forget the image that I saw there. I think Swami was blessing us to understand what India really is. Because there was Devi, he just, he was not a young man. He just had his dhoti on and a Brahmin thread. He'd slept on a little pad on the floor. And he was sitting cross-legged reading the Gita. And he looked up and I thought this could have been a thousand years ago seeing this beautiful devotee, so simple, just absorbed in the words of Krishna and the Gita. And I think Swami was, because he was indirect, Swamiji, I think he was saying, don't get distracted by modern India. 
remember who it really is. And then you will be able to go deep in your experience and help others to go deep. So remember, remember your cultural roots. Don't identify with the passing fads of today or tomorrow. They are only moments in time. But the eternal truth upon which Indian wisdom and culture and spirituality is based is your birthright. And it will get you through all of life's tests and trials. There's, a, I think it would be helpful to understand that there are different levels of tests and why those tests comes, or challenges, I should say. So I'm gonna split them in two parts. One is a challenge and the other is a test. A challenge is just part of life. The birds have challenges. They have to find a nest. They have to find food. They have to fly. They have to live in smoky conditions. So everything, all of life has challenges. It's just part of the way that God is setting up the drama that allows life to take place. And I was listening to a talk of Master yesterday and he said, you will never get there without service, meaning that we have to serve in order to become enlightened. He said, as long as you have to eat, you have to serve. So that's a pretty good, uh, I, I don't know, pretty good standard. So if you think you don't need to serve, that you're above that, ask yourself if you're also above eating. And if you are, then you don't need to serve. Otherwise, you do. But coming back to challenges and tests. So all of life has challenges. The difference I want to draw between a challenge and a test is that a challenge doesn't push up against the particular patterns of our, let's call them buttons, our likes and dislikes. Because let's, let's say that you're trying to take a mathematics test. If you're trying to study for that test, the way to uh, meet a challenge is, as Davey was saying, just put energy out. If you put energy out to study for that test, learn what you need to learn, then when you take the test, you'll be able to pass the test. So a test of that nature is a challenge. But there's another kind of test, and that's the test where you get pushed up against some delusion that you have or some kink in your energy flow. And that's what Davy was talking about the recurring patterns that come back again and again. So the challenges in life, you from your past lives have arrived at a certain point in this incarnation. And in this incarnation, you'll be able to relatively easily meet those things that you have met in the past and overcome. So. If you have studied hard in the past, you will have a bright mind, an intelligent mind, and then when you incarnate in this incarnation and you're having to study mathematics, you'll be able to do that. It won't be a big, a, a big test for you. But those things that you have not learned, especially the spiritual lessons, the attachments, and the... <coughs> energy blocks that lie in the subconscious, if you haven't overcome those, you will, by your magnetism, your spiritual magnetism, you will draw to yourself repeatedly that same test over and over and over again. And in fact, it will become very painful to draw that test to you. I'll just use an example. Let's say that you have the tendency 
to be very attached to the people around you, attached to your family, attached to your children, attached <coughs> to your siblings. <coughs> attached to your parents. If you have that deep attachment, then you will draw to yourself the test of losing those people because we have to ultimately, we have to understand that we are all one. You don't actually lose them. That was one of the first chapters of the Gita. The first lesson that Krishna gave to Arjuna who said, I can't, I'm attached to my siblings, I'm attached to my my cousins to my my teachers my my all all my kin i'm attached to them i can't lose them the first lesson that krishna gave arjuna was nobody ever dies we are all one that energy is just transmuted so i'm just using this as an example that if you have the kink in you of excessive attachment that magnetism will draw to you over and over and over again the loss of someone or something that you're attached to until finally often because of pain you finally say I want to release this many of you are taking a very very important step today which is discipleship in the beginning of that vow that Swami wrote, he talks about, thank you, he talks about, I have tried to do these things, I have tried to learn my lessons on my own, meaning through the ego. But now I understand that without your help, without the help of the divine, I will never deeply understand. So. I've tried to release these blockages from the ego, but without divine help, without some higher energy flowing through me, I can't really accomplish that. And when we make the step of becoming a disciple, then added to our power, our individual power, is the power of the guru and the power of, of the divine three times as strong as our power, four times as strong as our own power. So that will help us accomplish it. So a challenge, we just need to get the energy flowing. But a test will come to us again and again because there is some mistaken kinked energy that is blocking us from spiritual freedom. We saw a little short section of a movie by Rajnikant uh, that he made about Babaji. He's also a Kriyaban. Some of you may, may or may not know that, but a disciple of Babaji and of Yogananda. He made a little movie, uh, made a, a movie. We saw a little section of it. But he was drawn up and met Babaji, and Babaji gave him a mantra that he could use seven times, and when he used that mantra, whatever he wanted would come to pass, would, would take place. So it was a magical mantra that he could use seven times. And then he left, and a sage sitting with Babaji said, Master, is this a blessing or a curse? <laughs> and Babaji said, a test. We will see whether he uses this mantra for himself or for the benefit of others. And so all of life, we all have a magic mantra, which is God's life force flowing through us. Do we use that for selfish purposes? In which case, if we dedicate our life force to, to the ego, then we contract. If we dedicate our life force to trying to expand and find unity with God, then 
we grow through those things. So we have to have energy to meet a challenge, but we have to have energy plus the help of the divine flowing through us to overcome the tests or the blockages that we carry with us. And once we overcome those blockages, then we have more and more energy that is freed up to flow through us. And even Master had tremendous challenges, but he had no tests in the sense that he had no ego reference anymore. But he had to put out enormous energy to accomplish his mission because not for himself, he was trying to rise, raise the consciousness of the whole of the planet. And so that takes a lot of energy and he had to allow a lot of energy to flow through him, but it wasn't, he didn't have those personal challenges or kinks anymore. It was, he was only a channel for the divine. So I think that if we see the difference between a challenge which just requires energy and a test, which requires the change of consciousness, that if we have something that repeats again and again, that is our soul's way and the divine way of saying you have a kink in your consciousness that needs to be worked out. Ultimately, it takes more and more complete surrender. That's why we have the techniques of meditation which we have, which if we can meditate deeply and surrender, then that energy is freed up. But it takes deep self-offering. Now, the last part was how to meet our challenges also with joy. Well, joy is not something that we have to acquire. Joy is already within us. You already have as much joy within you as you will ever, ever have. The difference is just like you already have unity with God as much as you will ever have. The difference is that you're not aware of it. You're not aware of your unity with God, nor are you aware of your joy. And so meditation, at the end of each meditation, you should spend some time getting in touch with your innate sense of joy. Because if you can get in touch with that, then you'll be able to get in touch with it even in the midst of a deep challenge or even a test. Joy is still there because it's part of who we are. But we have to train ourselves to recognize it. Just like right now, if you could sit still, you could feel your heartbeat. But normally you can't feel your heartbeat because you haven't tuned into it. Nonetheless, your heart is there beating away 60, 70 times a minute all the time. And all you have to do is tune in. It would be a silly prayer to say, oh, make my heart beat. It's already beating. It would be a silly prayer to say, oh, give me joy. You already ha you, it's already there, already beating. But let me, aware, let me be aware of my heartbeat. That's a different thing. Let me be aware of my joy. That's a different thing. Let me be aware of my unity with you. That's a different thing. And so everything that comes to us is a blessing and a curse, like that mantra. It's a curse if we allow it to, that, that challenge to make us contract. It's a blessing if we allow that energy to allow us to expand and experience our greater self. But God has set up this whole world as a kind of a beautiful drama of, of this drama, really, of expanding, evolving consciousness until finally we realize our true self
So we'll take about 15 minutes or so and we'll have these questions and maybe Jyotish will take one and I'll take one. Many of them have already been answered during the discourse, but anyway. Okay. Master has said there is one technique better than Kriya. That is to keep the consciousness centered at the spiritual eye all of the time. How do I do this? And what are the signs that it is happening for me? Will it help in meeting life's challenges with courage and joy? I'll say it will. So how do we keep the I'll just how do we keep the energy at the spiritual eye? Well, Again, it's partly just remembering to do that. And you just, the mind is trainable. You just need to train it in a new pattern of behavior or a new circuit. So as you're sitting here, just try to feel, let's take a moment, try to feel that your energy is at the spiritual eye. Close your eyes. You can even place your finger there, place your finger between the point between the eyebrows for 15 seconds and just try to see light there. Now take your finger down and try to feel the energy at the spiritual eye. Now open your eyes and try to still feel the energy there. Probably most of you can do that, right? I think most of you can, you certainly can feel the pressure of your finger. You can probably feel your concentration there and you can probably keep part of that concentration even while your eyes are open. The challenge becomes when something else catches your attention. So if somebody came in here and started screaming and running around, most of you would lose the ability to keep your attention, at least partly there at the spiritual eye. So daily life is going to constantly distract you and you just have to train yourself to keep bringing your attention back. The more you do that, the more it will create a kind of a neural pattern that will help you be able to accomplish that. Another thing that I have found that is very helpful is that when you're quiet, then try to just spend a little time focusing and trying to either see light in the forehead or bring your energy there. If you wake up in the middle of the night, just look into the spiritual eye and as you do that more and more you'll train yourself uh, in order to be able to do that most of the time okay. I'm going to answer two questions uh, briefly the first one and it, it follows from what Jyotish was just saying how do I get rid of the guilt of not being able to meditate when I am in an unanticipated or challenging situation. Okay, there's two parts to this. Guilt about meditation. You know, that it's having guilt about not being able to meditate well enough or long enough or regularly enough. It can, you can use it as a tool to motivate you to be more regular, to be more committed. But basically, guilt is a self-destructive attitude. If you start thinking, oh, I'm a bad person, I didn't meditate, what's happening? You're just reinforcing the ego. But if you just think, meditation happened today for five minutes, and maybe, or two minutes, or maybe I woke up and I said, Jai Guru, and that's all that happened. But focus on what is positive, because that helps you to transcend the ego. But then to touch on, and Jyotish touched on this, again, meditation, you can see it as a battleground, the, a lifelong practice of meditation. 
and there will always, always, don't expect it to be different, challenges to the, your time to meditate, your ability to meditate. Maybe you've cleared off all, you're going to have a whole hour, and then the phone rings and there's some family disaster, and there goes your peace of mind. But you just factor that into the equation of a spiritual life. There will always be challenges to our peace of mind, but the secret is to make a, a long-term a long -term commitment. Just say, whatever comes up, if I have a terrible meditation, if I just am very, very cut my meditation short, I am committed in the long run to pursuing this activity and obstacles may come in my way. I'll deal with them the best I can. But my goal in, is to have a steady, deep meditation. And the secret is, when the blocks come, don't say, OK, I'm done. Say, I have been thwarted today, but tomorrow I will do better because I have a long-term commitment. So it's really anticipating that problems will come but then making the commitment to say, I will keep trying. And Master said, he gives us, and I, I mean, I think we are all disciples here of Master. He gives us his unconditional promise that if we try, he said, for those who try till the end, I promise that I, Yoganandaji, or one of our other line of gurus will be there to usher them personally into the astral plane. So we just, in our hearts, look for that connection, that commitment, where you say, this I will do. I will not waver. I will be thwarted. I will stumble. I will fall. But I will get up again, and I will keep going and throw guilt out the window, because it doesn't help you. And well, I think that was a long answer, so you go on. I thought it would be shorter. <coughs> <laughs> okay, part of your neural conditioning, while I look at the next question, put your finger at the point between the eyebrow, bring your energy there, and now not only feel light there, but also joy. And then open your eyes and try to hold it. Okay, when I came on the path, I was already in the middle of the race of getting bigger roles and earning more. How do we know how much is sufficient and let go, as Master says, of unnecessary necessities? I'm unable to come out of it. I have an extremely hectic job and a very difficult person to work for. Quitting doesn't seem an option, as I have responsibilities. How do I come out of it and create a balance? Why are so many of you smiling? Yes. <laughs> I think out of, there were 16 questions here. I think about a third of them had something, I have a terrible boss. <laughs> I don't like my work. What do I do about it? Okay, well this is, this is a big challenge, obviously, and it's a very real challenge because on the one hand, we do need to take responsibility. It's important for us to try to do well at work. It's because there's a lot of self-growth in that. It's important for us to try to earn the money that we need in order to keep a family or keep uh, our responsibilities. <clears throat> but then there's also a momentum that's, that gets going that is hard to look at and really take, take control over. How much money is enough money? Because after a certain point, it isn't about money anymore. It isn't about earning more. It shifts over to something else. Probably it shifts over to social position and how others look at you. Why do you need a big car Let's, or a fancy car? Why do you need a Mercedes when a 
simple, I don't know, a tata, will get you around the city just as well because a Mercedes gives you more social status. So why do you need more money? So it, after a while, it's not about money. It becomes about other things. And so the first step of answering this question of really looking at how do I get out of this pattern is that you need to reflect carefully enough and deeply enough to see why am I doing what I'm doing? What is it that still has some hunger in me? Because if you have a few million dollars, it isn't about money, it's about some other hunger. What is that hunger that is making me go through this job that I don't like with a boss that is abusive? Why do I keep doing that? And so you have to see where your motivation is. Once you begin to see where your motivation is, then you can begin to discriminate. Is this something that is really helping me achieve what I want, or am I just doing it because I've done it for so long? Do I really need more money? If it's about money, the answer is probably no, I'm not in need of that. Do I need more social status? Well, maybe there's still a hunger there, but at some point, maybe that's fed. And then at some point, you just say, there's no reason for me to continue doing what I'm doing. We had an incident, we showed the movie Finding Happiness to some relatives, and at the end, the Swami says, live to be happy. And right after the movie, one of Davy's sister-in-law said, you know, I'm, I'm past retirement age, but I'm still working. I don't need to work anymore. It isn't making me happy. I'm going to quit my job. She realized she shifted her motivation between whatever that job was and, and get being happy. So discriminate whether what you're doing is helping you to be happy or not. And if not, then you need to break the habit of what you're doing. Now, there's a whole nother issue about um, dealing with difficult people at work, but I don't know whether Davey wants to take that. Okay. <laughs> well, it actually, kind of, whoopsie. It kind of ties into the other question I'm going to address, and I'll tie it into that. This question is, what are the tips to achieve a fine balance between family responsibilities and the spiritual path? Well, I think the best tip I can give you is that it isn't a balance, it's a continuity. The spiritual path is not separate from family life, from um, difficult in-laws, from difficult colleagues or employers and so forth. Again, if you come back to seeing it all as part of a learning experience, if you see your family life as the opportunity to give to others, to serve, to be selfless, to give support and unconditional love, uh, you know, really have raising a family. Master says in Autobiography of a Yogi, in one paragraph, and most people don't see it, but he says, the householder path, if done with non-attachment, is a higher path than the path of renunciation. Higher path than the path of renunciation, if done with non-attachment. And so that's the secret. We fulfill our duty in the world. We care for our family, our children, our work with the difficult boss, but the what makes it part of the spiritual life is non-attachment. We're not saying, what's in this for me? What am I getting out of this? What are they giving me? But just, you, you fulfill your duty in the world without attachment. And if the boss is difficult, then you work in such a way, again, it's a test. What's the right attitude that I need to have? I can't expect him to change. 
He doesn't meditate. He's not on the spiritual path. But I can change. And that's, you know, the words of Master's great woman disciple, Gyanamata, where she said, I felt a test coming to me, she writes in one of her letters. And I knew I could not avoid it. And I went to pray to Guruji. And I knew the only prayer he would accept was, change no circumstances, change me. So that which you can't change in your life outwardly, how can I change inwardly? How can I be more patient, more harmonious, more collaborative? And so, and, and then at the end of the day, is it a blessing or a curse to have a difficult boss? It depends how you take it. It can be the greatest blessing in the world if you understand it's what you need to learn certain lessons. So I hope these answers are helpful. And I think now we- I'm gonna add just a little bit. Okay. Just, if you have a difficult boss, and especially if you've had a series of difficult bosses, <laughs> a lot of laughter at that one, huh? Then we need to start a course for difficult bosses. Yes, right. Yeah. Since there's a lot of them. Right. Then the question is, why do you keep drawing that circumstance? And there will be some. So that's a test for you. It's not just a challenge. Work is a challenge. The difficult boss is a test. You keep drawing that because something in you wants to change. And so begin to look at the patterns. Maybe it's that you need to be more assertive, that you need to stand up for yourself. Maybe you draw a difficult boss who's abusive because you have the tendency to be abusive. And you are drawn into that situation so you can see what it feels like when somebody's abusive. So if you have a difficult boss, ask yourself, am I a difficult boss? What about my children? How do they look at me? What about my spouse, my wife, or my husband? How do they look at me? Am I a difficult boss? Because I don't like having to live with a difficult boss. So that may be your test. That may be why you keep drawing them. Or it may be that you need to learn more inner strength and how to stand up for yourself. Maybe it's about non-attachment. Could be about many, many different lessons in this. But as Davy said, you're not likely to change your difficult boss. So either you need to change your environment, move on to a different job, or if you can't, then you need to learn what the lesson is there. And Ashish will be offering a class for difficult bosses. <laughs> and, and you can sign up your boss and, and let him know about it. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs>